I am here representing Allegheny College as part of the scholarly program uh, here to do a demonstration on uh, Math 151 or Calculus 1 here at Allegheny College. Uh, for those of you uh, getting familiar with Zoom, uh, if you want to, you can pin my particular screen. This is where most of the focus is going to be, uh, though I will uh, flip to another one in, uh, in the future, but it should automatically be able to that. Um, but before we get, begin, uh, I do um, going to go through kind of a demonstration. What does this course uh, look like? What can you expect to see while you're in the classroom? Uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about what this course is. Uh, this is Math 151 uh, at Allegheny College, Calculus 1. Uh, the nice part about this class is this is a fairly standard calculus class that you would see uh, at an American institution. Uh, this covers both a differential and an, inter and an introduction to inter uh, integral calculus. So we'll be learning all about derivatives and limits and a lot number of their applications and eventually getting an introduction um, to integral calculus and so doing integrals um, and even use substitute or substitution techniques. Uh, this means that this is fairly, like I said, fairly standard for a calculus course in the United States, um, which means it should transfer fairly readily to other institutions and it will get you on track to start here at Allegheny uh, in a number of programs, including math, physics, uh, and chemistry. Um, so this is uh, a very useful course to start off uh, your uh, college career with. Um, <clears throat> as for uh, my course in particular, uh, this course is going to be uh, reasonably lecture based. So I will be coming in uh, during our time and generally talking about the basic tools of capitalists, what concepts, what ideas, you need to do to be able to do the kind of problem solving that we'd like you to see and come out of with this course. So introducing the ideas of limits, what can we say with limits, how do we compute limits, what does it mean both analytically, graphically, um, and from a data perspective. Um, moving on the same kind of questions with derivatives, how do I compute derivatives, what does the derivative tell me, can I come up with a geometric interpretation of it, and do I have a real world application for it? We're going to be touching on all of these various ideas. And finally, the same thing when we eventually get to integration. Um, <clears throat> so we'll be talking about those in class um, and we'll be going over these basic properties. I'll be doing a number of examples so you can see how they work. And then outside of class, there'll be daily kind of there'll be daily homeworks and quizzes for you to get some practice uh, on these skills where you'll be getting both, uh, you'll have practice problems to work on. You will have um, a number of opportunities to get feedback from both me and um, I'm going to be using an online resource known as WebWork, which will give you some instant feedback so you can attempt problems whenever uh, you are able to. So at any time of day, you'll be able to get some feedback on those problems as well. Um, because what's going to, what we're going to see in this course uh, in math in general is practice is going to be key. You're going to have to try these problems over and over again in order to get comfortable and recognize the patterns that we're looking for uh, in calculus. Um, further from that, um, well, even though you're going to be practicing a lot of these on your own outside of class, I'll be opening up additional class time to kind of clear any doubts that you might have on those kinds of problems. So we'll have opportunity what, when we meet in class to discuss um, what we didn't understand, what we want to practice a little bit more, um, and we'll hopefully have some time to clear that up. That'll be covering most of the learning opportunities, so uh, between lecture and your practice outside of class, but we will also be doing uh, a fair bit, uh, we'll also have to deal with kind of assessment. Um, and assessment's gonna be coming in two forms. I've kind of broken it up into both portfolio problems, which are longer math problems, uh, calculus problems in particular, which really kind of make, uh, challenge you to really demonstrate that you understand and explain the content that we've been covering in class. So we've got four of those throughout the semester. Um, they'll have uh, probably about a page or two write up um, that would be required in order to answer these problems. And then beyond that, um, there will be two uh, major assessments. There'll be a midterm assessment and a final assessment. Um, so uh, they will substantial exam covering the material that we covered that point in the course. 
generally how that would work. Um, I will post that online. We'll be using an online resource known as Canvas to deliver a, number, a lot of content uh, and uh, for you to be able to access again at any time. There'll be a scheduled time for you to meet with the class, join in the Zoom call um, kind of like this with your camera on. You'll be taking uh, that assessment uh, and then once you're done, scan it and submit it. Um, and that's generally how uh, you'll be uh, assessed in the course. Um, but other than that, um, that's pretty much how the course is run. Um, does anybody have any questions or is there anything that uh, somebody would like me to address before we kind of see what a class might look like uh, today? Uh, you can either free, feel free to raise your, there's a raise hand function in uh, Zoom. I should be able to monitor that. Or if you want to just type a question in chat, uh, feel free to do that at any time, actually. So real quick, if anybody just wants to take a quick opportunity to ask a quick question. Professor Dodge, how yes. much how much classwork or how many hours should a student expect to spend on the course in a week outside of the classroom? Outside of the classroom, um, during the course of a week, I definitely expect outside of the classroom at least a couple hours a day. So probably estimating about at least two hours a day working on uh, problems outside. It's obviously going to vary a little bit from student to student, but uh, that's kind of what my expectation is. This is going to be a very dense class, obviously. Um, generally, a calculus class would run about 15 weeks. We are crushing that into about five. Um, so this is going to take a substantial amount uh, of focus from you during uh, the semester. Will you cover imaginary numbers as well? No, we won't be doing anything with imaginary numbers in this particular course. Um, typically, at least at Allegheny, we don't cover uh, imaginary numbers and uh, complex numbers until we get to uh, complex analysis, which is a 300 level course. So typically junior, uh, third year or higher. Junior, sorry, junior or senior year. Right. I am not seeing any other questions. So I will keep monitoring uh, the chat. So if at any point anybody has a question, obviously please feel free to type it or if you want to use the raise hand function, um, if you open up participants at the bottom of the Zoom call, uh, at the bottom right, after you do that, at the bottom right, there is a button that you can say to say raise hand. I'll be trying to monitoring that, be monitoring that as well. So feel free um, to uh, utilize either chat or the raise hand for me to call on you. Um, but that being said, and I think it's appropriate for us to get uh, started. This is intended to give you an idea of what a class might look like, or at least part of a class might look like. Generally, meeting for 90 minutes or an hour and a half, uh, five days a week. Um, this is going to be about a half an hour demo of what a course or a class might look like. So we won't get the full picture, but um, <clears throat> uh, this will kind of give you an idea. Uh, Kubrick and uh, yes, we will be doing an introduction to integral calculus. Um, most, uh, a great deal more of integral calculus is covered in the second course, which is uh, uh, Math 152. But um, we do do an introduction, basic integration techniques, uh, or some, yeah, some of the basic integration techniques, um, including substitution. Uh, that's kind of standard practice for uh, calculus courses in the United States. Um, but yes. We will be touching on that uh, at least a little bit. Great question. Um, this is kind of, so just to give you an idea, I am doing a topic. So if you have not taken any calculus or done any calculus before and you can't follow all the details that we're doing, um, this demonstration is meant to be a topic that's done in the middle of the late end of the course. 
Um, so this is toward the end. Uh, we're getting to the topic of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, really interesting topic. I thought it'd be a fun one to do the demonstration from. Uh, but again, if this isn't something that you're familiar with, if this isn't something, if you don't understand all the background information, you would if you were in this course. Um, so please don't uh, feel left behind from that. Okay. This is again just to give you a feel of what the course would look like. All right. Again, if there are any other questions, please keep them coming. I will be monitoring chat as we move forward. Great. We will be doing some uh, applications of derivatives, yes. Um, <clears throat> those will be kind of, those will be covered a lot more in um, the portfolio problems when you're taking home to work on them, but we will be covering uh, a bit of how they can be applied in class as much time as we have for them, um, but yes. All right. So let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about a very, very important topic and kind of culminating everything that we've done in calculus thus far. Uh, this is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, but before we get there, I kind of want to motivate um, why we're doing that. Sorry, uh, just pausing on the question real quick. Will you take partial derivatives? This course does not have partial derivatives. You typically partial derivatives wouldn't be covered until uh, the second course. So in math 152. So Calculus 2 here at Allegheny College will cover partial derivatives. So let's get back um, and kind of remind ourselves where we were last time. Um, what were we covering and how did we get started? So we were just working on this particular problem. We were monitoring uh, how far a car traveled over the course of an hour. And all we knew was how fast it's going. So what we were given is this function f of t, and that told us the velocity at any time t of the truck or of our car was f of t. Can we use that information in order to figure out how far it was traveled? Now, what we wanted, to, what we kind of we instinctually wanted to do is use what we know about um, velocity and distance and use the kind of co the constant velocity in, uh, formula that we did back in uh, some time in physics. So in general, if we have something traveling at a constant velocity, v, and we want to know how far it's going to travel, really should be delta t, and we want to know how far this thing has traveled, that's going to be equal to the velocity times the change in time, how long it was traveling at that speed. And this is the formula that we're working with. But in general, when we're working at this one, we're watching our car traveling for an hour. As you know, whenever you're traveling, very rarely do things for a long period of time travel at the exact same speed. Yes, you could set cruise control or something like that, but more than likely you're speeding up, you're slowing down, you're accommodating for traffic. So since our function, our velocity is changing as a function of time, we don't have this luxury of having a constant velocity in order to determine distance. So what we did is use, it came up with an approximation first. How far would it travel? And what we did is we broke up our hour into 60 minute or into 61 minute intervals. And for each interval, we could estimate how far it traveled by assuming it was about constant. So maybe for about a minute, we we're traveling close to a constant speed. And that's what this was. For each minute, so we did this 60 times. For each minute, we had a, dis a velocity times a distance, and that gave our velocity times a time, our change in time, and that gave us a distance traveled. And what we do is add all of them up in order to get an actual velocity. Or, sorry, an actual distance. So the sum of all these little distances gave us an actual distance or approximation. Now this wasn't exactly correct, but what we saw is if we did it even uh, more frequently, if we didn't do it every minute, but maybe we did it every second or every tenth of a second, our approximation kept getting better and better. And ultimately what we wanted was an infinite number of time intervals. We wanted to do this summation an infinite number of times, but we weren't able to do that. Trying to add up an infinite number of things is bonkers and we wouldn't be able to do that. What we used is we took advantage of a concept we've been working on all semester long, which is the limit. Whenever we want to do something at infinity, what we can do instead is push that quantity to infinity by taking the limit. 
And this is the idea. And what we ended up getting was the exact answer was the limit as n goes to infinity of this object, of this approximation. So this is the first example that we saw. Professor, one request. Uh, could you also share your screen, please? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. So that was what we did for velocity. Um, but we saw another very similar uh, problem show up as well. Another question we were looking at. We had we had some function which is y equal to f of x, and what we wanted to know was what was the area under the curve above the x-axis and between the two vertical or vertical lines x equals a and x equals b. And again, what we saw is we could approximate that by chopping up the interval, and for each for each interval, we did an approximating rectangle. We can do this a number of times. And for each time, what we got is we took the, found the area of the rectangle. And the area of the rectangle ended up being the height of the rectangle, which was f of x i, times the width of the rectangle, which ended up being delta x. So for each of these objects, what we got is we summed up each area of the rectangle, and that gave us an approximation to the actual area underneath the curve. Now what we saw again is we got a better approximation if we did smaller and smaller rectangles. If we did more rectangles and made them thinner. We can think of this kind of like re resolution on a TV. The finer the pixels, the better the image is going to come out. And that's exactly what happened. We wanted more and more rectangles. We wanted our n to be larger. n is counting the number of rectangles. And just like before, we wanted the best possible approximation, which in some sense means we wanted an infinite number of rectangles. For the same purpose as before, or same reason as before, you can't have an infinite number of rectangles. I can't draw it. I can't work with that. So what I need to do is make use of the limits which we've been studying since the beginning of the semester. By taking the limit of this approximation, what we got was the actual answer. <clears throat> so hopefully we see a little bit of a pattern here between the first and the second example. What we have is an approximation looks like a function times a sum of a function times a delta, a change in that variable, and the actual answer is the limit of that approximation. Same thing here. We have the original fun the summation, and the limit of that summation is the approximation. Now, you might think these two examples are kind of limited. How often are you going to need the area under the curve? How often are you going to need uh, to get the distance from the velocity function? Well, maybe some of you are going to move into statistics. If you want to understand the probability of something, so just for example, maybe you want to know what's the probability of somebody between uh, 5 foot 11 and 6 foot 1. If you know the probability density function, you can calculate that probability by, again, you can get an approximation by the sum of this quantity. And if you take that approximation to the limit as n goes to infinity, you'll get the exact answer. Maybe you're a little less ther theoretical. Maybe you're into economics. <clears throat> Suppose you want to know how well your economy is doing, doing, and you want to look at a particular commodity. Well, if you look at the supply and demand function, once you have the supply and demand function, you look at the difference, again, you can look at the economic surplus, which is a good quantitative way to look at how well your economy is doing. <clears throat> this summation, again, will approximate that economic surplus. And if you take the limit of that approximation, you'll get the exact answer. For those of you interested in physics, perhaps you want to launch a rocket into orbit <clears throat> and you want to know how much energy do you need to get out of the fuel that you're burning. Well, that's going to be a calculation of kinetic energy. And it's going to be based on the force of gravity. Again, you can approximate that energy with a sum. And the limit of that sum will give you the exact amount. If you're working in the lab and you need to know how much energy you need to burn or get into your uh, particular concentrate in order to figure out if you get it to a particular temperature, again, if you know the heat capacity function, the approximation is a sum, and the exact amount is this limit. For those of you going to life sciences, perhaps you need to know how much of a particular chemical is in the body. Well, again, if you know the difference between infusion and absorption, you can sum up 
the function times the delta T in order to get uh, an approximation to that amount of drug in the system, and the limit of that will give you the exact amount, okay? These are a very limited scope of the applications and how often this type of problem comes up. Hopefully you notice how different these are. We were talking about energy, we were talking about drugs in the body, we were talking about economic surplus. This type of problem and this, these type, different types of problems ultimately lead to the same kinds of answers over and over again. A question, an answer where we can approximate it using the sum and where we can actually get the answer by taking the limit of that sum. When we see this in mathematics over and over again, it means we have some sort of pattern, and this is what we're going to be looking at in calculus and what we have been looking at all course long. We want to recognize these patterns, and we want to utilize them, okay? And because we're seeing the exact same form show up over and over again, we do the same thing we usually do. We generalize, and what we're going to do is give it a name. All right. So... <clears throat> This is all we're doing right now, is we're just adding notation to this problem that we keep seeing coming up in all sorts of applications of mathematics. What we want to do is we notice that the approximation kept coming up. So what we're going to do is call, give that approximation name. This is going to be one way to represent it. We call this the Riemann sum. There are actually other ways to do the Riemann sum. But for each, for a given function, defined on some domain from A to B, what we can do is define the Riemann sum as a summation, this thing that we kept seeing over and over again, where delta x is this quantity, and we can get our xi stars, the things we're plugging into f of x, um, in a very similar way to what we did before. These xi stars, again, think of the, uh, the area under the curve. We broke up our domain into a bunch of subintervals, and we just pick one point in each interval, and this gives us a Riemann sum. Now, what we are really interested in is not the approximation. We want the actual answer. It's the limit of the Riemann sum, which we give a name because it comes up so often. This is the definite integral. The definite integral is the limit of this approximation given, given all this background information. Okay. <clears throat> and now what we're going to do is look at this outside of any context of all those applications for the moment. What we understand is regardless, in all of these other contexts, the same problem comes up. Well, let's focus on the part that we have to solve, this thing right here, the definite integral, okay? Now, the other thing I want to take in, uh, into account, I know a number of you were asking questions about what we'll be talking, some of you mentioned integral calculus. I assume some of you may have seen integration before at some point. The important thing that I want you to take away right now is that this object, even though I know some of you have seen calculus before, have a strong connection with this object to something called an antiderivative. On its own, this object has nothing to do with an antiderivative. This object is just a bunch of notation. So everything, this, these 10 symbols that we have here, this integral symbol, a to b, f of x, dx, this is just shorthand for this entire paragraph of information. And really what it's telling you is, if you see this, I want you to calculate the limit as n goes to infinity of the Riemann sum. That's what it's asking you to do. <clears throat> we'll talk about why we have this connection to antiderivatives in a minute, but that's the thing we want to take away from now. Okay? Now, what's the, so what is our goal? Moving forward is, again, we're taking all the context away from it. I want you to be able to go into your biology class, into your chemistry class, into your physics class, and whatever definite integral shows up, I want you to be able to handle it. So rather than focusing on why the integral in a particular case uh, is the answer, why the definite integral uh, tells you that you get this particular amount of energy or why it gives you the internal economic surplus. I'm going to leave that a little bit to your other classes. What I want you to be able to handle is once you get that problem, that you can be able to solve it. So I want you to be able to be given as many different functions f of x and be able to calculate the definite integral from a to b for as many of those functions as possible. That's our goal. Now, what I want you to sh first show you is how challenging it is to do by brute force. So this is going to be an example that's way simpler than something you probably would get in one of your courses. This is just the integral of x, the definite integral of x squared from 0 to 2. 
This function is fairly simple. It's just a power function. But still, even in the simple case, trying to do the limit of the Riemann sum is rather challenging. So I want to talk you through this. Please, everybody, if you're taking notes, put them down. I don't need you to be able to recreate this. I just want you to appreciate what it takes to do a definite integral by definition. Well, first, in order to establish everything, you need to figure out what your delta x is. Once you pick your delta x's, you need to use that to determine your intervals, which I've done here. My xi's are going to be uh, 0 plus i times my delta x. So I get 2i over n. Then once I have all my xi's, that allows me to choose what my xi stars are, the thing I'm going to plug into my function. I'm going to choose right endpoints, so it's going to give me xi stars the same as xi. So I can plug that into my f of x and I get four over uh, four i squared over n squared. So this is what the first step would look like, just figuring out what f of x i star is. Now let's move on. So this is just starting to get to the Riemann sum. That tells me what the Riemann sum is. My, <coughs> my f of x i star is what's gonna give me the four i squared over n squared. And my delta x, as we found and calculated before, is 2 over n. So then I can go ahead and simplify this to get 8i squared over n cubed. And then I can, since uh, the only thing that i depends on, I can factor out everything out without an, an i because that's going to be constant. So this is going to be 8 over n cubed times the summation of i squared. Now this is still rather challenging. What's the summation of i squared from i equals 1 to n? Again, what does this notation mean? This means plug in one, plug in two, plug in three, and then keep adding up. So what's one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared all the way up to n? Well, here's where we need to use something actually outside of calculus. There's a nice combinatorial result <coughs> that actually tells us if I added that up for any n, so if you wanted to figure out what the summation of i squared from 1 up to 100 is, you just plug in 100 here. So this would be 2 times 100 cubed plus 3 times 100 squared plus 100 divided by 6. Okay? So this is just giving me a formula that will allow me to calculate what the summation will always be. This, again, is not something I would be holding you accountable for. Just being able to recognize this trick is a difficult but step a, in actually calculating. It's a distinct. Sorry, what was that? Okay, I'm going to assume we're okay. Um, which means we can replace in our summations. Remember, this is what our, right here, this 8 over n cubed times the summation, that's what our Riemann sum is. We replace the summation with this formula and simplify. What we have now is a significantly simpler expression for Re the Riemann sum. So this is our expression for the Riemann sum. That's all we've accomplished so far. We still haven't finished this integral, but we're getting closer. What we have is, since we have this Riemann sum, we know the actual integral. This thing we've been trying to calculate is the limit as n goes to infinity of this Riemann sum. So this is going to be the limit of that expression that I just got. <clears throat> In order to help me calculate this, I'm going to factor out n cubed from the numerator and the denominator. And then I'm going to get to the point where I have the limit and I can use my limit laws here. I know the limit of a constant 2 is just going to be 2. The limit of 3 over n is going to be 3 times uh, 1 over n goes to 0. So it's going to be 3 times 0. And the limit of 1 over n squared is also 0 as n goes to infinity. And then again, the limit of 6 as n goes to infinity is 6. This all simplifies down to 8 over 3. That was just for x squared. OK? Would it take me four slides? Um, and some combinatorial result uh, concerning i squared that I may or may not have known. Think about how difficult this would have been if I replaced this with a trig function, if I was doing the integral of, say, tangent squared x. Do we have any summation function here uh, for the summation of tangent squared x? I don't have a good one. <clears throat> and this is just too much work for a simple function. So what I'm looking to do here is look for a more efficient way to solve this. This is an incredibly challenging problem on its own. We want to do better. And that's what our goal here is today, is to figure out a better way to calculate the definite integral. But before we can do that, we need to talk about some of the properties that the definite integral has. And probably the easiest way to go about that 
is actually just to look at um, it from a visual perspective. And we won't go through the proofs of these properties, but rather we'll talk about why it makes sense that they are accurate. So what we're gonna be doing is making use of the visual interpretation. <clears throat> One way to think about what the definite integral is, is to think of it as the area underneath the curve. So if I have a fu function f of x and I graph y equals f of x, the value of the definite integral is going to be this blue region right here, the area of this blue region, the area below the graph, above the x-axis, between the two vertical lines, x equals a and x equals b. Once we recognize that, we can kind of see some important properties of the definite integral. So what do I mean by that? First, let's start with a simple function. What happens when we have a constant? Well, if, func if a function is a constant, we know the graph of a function that's a constant is just a horizontal line. <clears throat> and so if we have this a horizontal line here, we have this vertical lines, A and B, and this is parallel to the X axis, can anybody type in chat at all? What shape do I have here? Anybody still with me? Very good. We have a rectangle, right? And we know what the area of a rectangle is. It's just gonna be the height which is going to be, since this is the function y equals c, the height is going to be c. Wow, that was terrible. And the length here is going to be the difference between the right end point and the left end point. So the difference, which is going to be b minus a, is going to give us the width of this rectangle. So C times B minus A is the area of the rectangle, and we know that area is going to be the definite integral. So in this simple case, when we just have a constant function, the definite integral is actually really easy to calculate. That's the first property we're going to make use of. The next one we want to make use of should seem fairly intuitive. What I want you to imagine is the area under the function G of X, we're going to color blue. The area under the function F of X, we're going to color red. So if I draw this function, if f of x is always less than or equal to g of x, that means the blue line here is always going to be above the red line, which means that when we do this definite integral, the red area, this red region, is always going to be inside the blue region, which means the red area is going to be less than or equal to the blue area, which gives us this inequality. If the function is less than or equal to the other function, the definite integral on that region is going to be less than or equal to the other function. So what we have is an inequality on a set of functions is going to give us an inequality on our definite integrals. Hopefully fairly intuitive. Hopefully we can see what's going on here. And then finally, we have this other property about adding, uh, doing sums over intervals for particular functions. So let's say we have something, we have, we're doing our integral from A to B, and we have some intermediate value C. In that case, what we can do is let's look at the integral from first A to C, and then we'll look at the integral from B to C. I colored the one from A to C, red. I colored the one from B to C, blue. And now what we do, if we do the sum of both of them, it's going to be the red area plus the blue area, which hopefully you can see is the same as if I do the integral all the way from A to B. So what this is saying is essentially we can break up definite integrals through intermediate values. We can kind of mess with the bounds a little bit and break them up uh, along these summations. So these are the three properties we need um, to really focus on and kind of understand what's going on here. All right. So again, all these three properties, what I'm trying to do is, given an arbitrary function, I want to compute the definite integral. And I'm trying to look for a very efficient way of doing that. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is introduce another tool in order to help me do that. So let's define this function. I'm gonna define the function, suppose I have a continuous function f of x on some interval a to b. I'm gonna define this weird looking function that is g of x, which is the integral 
from A up to X of F of T dt. So I'm introducing this dummy variable T in order to help me define everything, but the real function is defined as the definite integral. So another way to think about this, I have this function from A to B, and G of X is gonna be defined in this interval. Essentially, G of X is just the output. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug in X, the output I'm going to get is the, air, the red area here. I'm going to go from A up to whatever X is. I'm going to look at that area. That's going to be the value of G of X. Okay. Well, this function is rather difficult to deal with, um, but it has some interesting properties. Now that we have this new function, we're going to ask the same question we've asked about a lot of functions in this course so far. Here's my function. What's the derivative? So how would I compute the derivative of this new function? Well, hopefully you recognize it doesn't fall into any of your derivative rules. There's no exponent here. I can't just bring down the exponent and multiply by that exponent in order to get the derivative. It's not just a basic trig function. It doesn't follow any of my derivative rules. Whenever we encounter a new function that doesn't follow any of our derivative rules and we want to ask a question about the derivative, our only option is to go back to the limit definition. So thinking way back, that's that g of x plus h minus g of x all over h and take the limit as h goes to zero. We've been working with this since the beginning of the semester. This is the object we need to calculate even for this goofy function. So all I'm going to do is replace g of x plus h and g of x with what they are. That's x plus h, the integral from a to x plus h of f of t dt minus the integral a to x of f of t dt. I need to work on this. This is still rather difficult to mess with. But I'm going to work on simplifying. Let's focus on the numerator. Let's suppose I have f of x. <coughs> uh, I have the. I want to look at the difference between a to x plus h and the and a to x. So what I'm doing is I'm doing this whole region from a to x plus h, and what I want to do is subtract off the red region. So this whole re the whole region is the first thing, and I'm subtracting off the integral from uh, a to x. If I sub take the whole region here underneath the curve from a to a x plus h, and I subtract off the red region, all that's going to be left is the blue. So it's just going to be the integral from x to x plus h. So it's not a huge improvement, but that means, keep in mind, this right here this is what our numerator was in the previous equation. That was our, that seems to be good. That was our g of x plus h minus g of x. So I can simplify the numerator there with the simpler expression, which is just the integral from x to x plus h of f of x dt. All right, so now I can just focus on this numerator. Let's keep going. What I'm going to do is introduce a new idea, which is the maximum and the minimum. So I'm going to fix the interval from x to x plus h. That function is going to be either increasing or decreasing. It can go up and down. I'm just going to give a name to it. I'm going to say big M is going to be the maximum value that that function takes on, and little m is going to be the smallest value that, value that that function takes on. So keep in mind, this is just one way to look at f of x. Maybe this line is decreasing. Maybe it goes up and down in this interval. I don't care. I'm just going to make that uh, this the min and that's the max. So purple for max, green for min. Okay. And now I want to talk about what's going to happen on uh, as I make h really, really small. So keep in mind, that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm ultimately trying to do the limit as h goes to zero. So first off, hopefully you can visualize. What happens when I make h really, really small? That means this value right here, this line, is going to push in that direction. As I move that right-hand line closer and closer, hopefully you can all see, visualize that. I'm going to just move my sliding bar. I'm going to keep the blue line the same. I'm going to move that black line to the left more and more. And hopefully you can see, as that happens, the purple line and the green line are going to come closer and closer together, and they're going to meet at this point right here. They're going to meet where f of x is. So that tells us, hopefully visually, gives us an indication that the limit of the maximum value is the same as the limit of the minimum value, and both of those are going to be whatever f of x is. At that particular value of x, it's going to give us our f of x. So that's the first 
observation we want to make about these maximum mins. Next, what about the area underneath the maximum min line? So we can think of the max as a curve. The max is the line y equals mh, and the min is this other line y equals little mh. Okay. Now these are constant functions. We already know about constant functions. We can talk about uh, what those areas are, but in particular, what we can see is I'm going to color the area under the min, under the little m. I'm going to color that green. Still, I'm going to color the area under f blue, and the area under um, big M H purple. So hopefully, everybody sees the green is contained in the blue, and the blue is contained in the purple, which means the area or the definite integral of little m has to be less than or equal to the integral or the area under blue, which has to be less than or equal to the area under purple. So this definite integral has to be less than this definite integral has to be less than this definite integral. <clears throat> Again, we're just looking at this visually. Next, and final observation that we need, keep in mind that both of these were constants. We had the purple, if I just visualize the purple, try it in your mind to remove the blue and remove the green. Purple is just a rectangle. Same thing is true of green, which means the area is going to be the same of what we talked about with constant functions. So the area of big, M, uh, big M is just going to be big MH minus and the difference of the bounds. So X plus H minus X, which is just H. So I'm just getting H times MH. And the same thing is going to happen on little m. I'm just going to get little h or h times little m of h. So those are the three fact observations I can make from these graphs. How does this help me? First off, notice that again we have this inequality. We talked about this in our second observation, but we know what this integral is, and we know what this integral is, which means we can say that the blue integral is between h m h. And it's all and h big m h. Now, if I take this, that is less than this, is less than this, I can divide everything by h as long as h is not equal to zero. So when h is not equal to zero, I know this thing that I'm trying to calculate the limit of, the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt over h is between little m and big m. Now here's the fun part. We also observe that big M and little m are both going, to, as h goes to zero, are both going to the same place. As h goes to zero, big M is going to f of x. As uh, little m, or as h goes to zero, little m is going to f of x. So what we have is a very uh, interesting thing we saw before when we did the derivative of sine. We have a function that's going, that is always on top, that's going to a particular location. We have another function. That's going, that's on bottom, that's going to a particular location. And we have this other one that's in between. But the top and the bottom function are squeezing it toward the same place. So if both the top and the bottom are both going to f of x, that means that the thing in the middle also is getting squeezed. Imagine just barricades, just forcing it into this narrow path, and it's forced to go to f of x, which means the limit of this object, as h goes to zero, has to be equal to f of x. But the limit of this object was the derivative. So putting this all together, we get our theorem. This is the first fundamental theorem of calculus. It doesn't look, it looks a little obtuse, but the idea is, remember, this is how I define that function, g of x. And the point that I want you to focus on right now is that the derivative of that function is f of x, okay? <clears throat> so what we have is given an arbitrary f of x, we have this function defined by this definite integral, and its derivative will always be f of x. Now, I told you that we were looking for a quick way to figure out how to solve uh, definite integrals. And so far, it doesn't look like I've done that. All I've done is establish that, all right, I can give you this weird looking function, and I can find the derivative. There are plenty of applications for this, but this is not what we're interested in right at the moment. I want to show you how this thing actually helps us. Now let's, what we want to do is take any function. Suppose that I have any other function at all. I know g of x has a derivative of f of x, but suppose I have any other function. Keep in mind whenever we say this, there's always more than one function that has the same derivative. If I take the derivative of x squared, I get 2x. If I take the derivative of x squared plus 5, I get 2x. If I take the derivative of x squared plus a million, I get 2x. We know there are multiple things that can give the same derivatives. 
And the thing is that any few things with the same derivative have something in common. So let's suppose I have any other function that has the same derivative, that has the derivative of little f of x, which means it has the same derivative as g of x. So the f of x and big f of x and little g have the same exact derivative. Well, what does that mean? That means they're almost the same. They have to be basically the same thing, except one's off by a constant. Okay, so big F is the same as little g, except it's different than the constant. The same like x squared or x squared plus 5 or x squared plus half a million, whatever you have, these two are almost the same. It's just got a little constant on the end. Okay, now we have all the tools to help us figure out how to solve definite integrals. Why? <clears throat> Let's observe. If I do f of b minus f of a, so this is f, again, is any thing that has a derivative of little f of x. That's going to be g of b plus c minus g of a plus c. This will be equal to g of b minus g of a, which is going to be these two definite integrals. And now one other thing to worry about, what is this going to be? Think about this. This is this integral right here. If I have some function f of x, this is the integral from a to n. Well, that's just the area of a line, of a vertical line. That's going to have zero area. So that gives us a zero here, which means this simplifies at the end to just the definite integral, the integral from a to b of f of x. This being equal to this last line here is the point. If I have the definite, if I have some function whose derivative is f of x, that tells me that the definite integral, the value of the definite integral is just the difference between f of b and f of a. And this gives us a really important tool. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. If we have a function f of x, the integral from a to b of f of x, if I can find any function whose derivative is f of x, then what I can say, so this is just notation, shorthand notation for this. This is saying take f of x, plug in b, plug in a, and subtract. So this definite integral is going to be equal to f of b minus f of a. To really drive this point home, let's look at the example we did at the start of this. This is the definite integral of x squared. Remember last time, it took me like three or four slides. I had to use a bunch of different identities. I didn't take this limit. It was an absolute mess. Also remember what we got for the answer was 8 over 3. After all that work, we got 8 over 3. Now let's use the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus. So first thing we want to know, all right, I need to find something whose derivative is x squared. Well, I need that means by the power rule, I need something with one power higher, and I'm going to use this factor of three divided by three to count compensate for that. So notice the anti or the something. I will talk about that uh, in a minute. That's a very good question. <coughs> um, so real quick, so we have this function x cubed over three. The derivative of this is going to be x squared. So we have something whose derivative is x squared, which means by the fundamental theorem, this is just going to be x cubed over 3 from 0 to 2. We just plug in 2, plug in 0, subtract, and we get 8 thirds. It took us two lines. Does everybody see this? This took us so much less. Shakar, that is a fantastic question. And um, in general, what we have to do is we have to make use of that other property. So I'm actually. Uh, we'll leave this here. I'm actually going to let's address that. I want to stop sharing. So hopefully everybody saw that uh, Shakar had uh, had a very good question here. What happens when we don't have a Um, a non-continuous function. So the example that he gave was, what did you say? You said greatest integer function. So that would look something like this. So one, two, three, four. So open circle. Uh, 
What we can make use of here, so the problem ends up being we have several discontinuities. What we have is jump discontinuities at every single integer, at one, two, three, four, and so on. So say we wanted to do something like the integral um, from, I don't know, one up to three of this function. So this is my y equals the greatest integer function on this, f of x. Now, technically, what we need to do is uh, use something called improper integrals because we have this discontinuity. But we'll make it a little bit simpler right now. And the important part is what you really need to do is, in this particular case, the key is, yes, this is not a completely continuous function, but the number of discontinuities is finite. You can kind of deal with them. So the key is, if you want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, you need to break up around those discontinuities. So if I'm going from one to three, the one that I'm really concerned with, there's actually a concern about this one at one. The one I'm really concerned with, though, is here at two. They have a break here. The fundamental theorem C it says I need to be continuous on this interval. So but what I can do is break this up using that, what is it, the second property or third property we have. We break it up as the integral from one to two of f of x dx plus the integral from two to three of x dx. Now we do have still an issue of this point right here being a discontinuity. So I don't wanna go down this road too much. What you need to use is an improper integral uh, in order to deal with the one and the two on this uh, in order to really make this rigorous. But in general, what you can do is just break it up and so that you don't have those discontinuities. You can break up around them. Does that answer your question, Shikhar? Yes, Professor, it does. Thank you. So for those of you, uh, we don't cover improper integrals in Math 151, but for those of you who want kind of a quick look ahead, how you would solve this because of uh, the discontinuity there, we would do this, this is equal to the limit as S goes to one on the left side, or no, right side, of S to two of F of X dX plus the limit as t goes to 2 on the right side of the integral t to 3 f of x dx. And you're able to work all this out because you're f of x. Now you can make work this out and use the fundamental theorem because on the integral from s to 2 f of x, this is just going to be uh, 2 and this is just going to be 3. So these end up being constants and you can calculate these uh, quite easily using. Uh, the fundamental theorem. Okay? Yeah, thank you, Professor. Absolutely. Um, also, so hopefully this has given you a quick idea of what's going on. Uh, another thing to note, so hopefully you can flip a little bit between my screen that I'm sharing and the other one uh, that is coming up. But we'll also just give you an idea. I mentioned earlier we'll be making use of an online homework system known as WebWork. So this is just to give you an idea. This is what uh, some of your homeworks might look like. You'll have a bunch of problems that look like this, um, and you will be able to answer, attempt these as many times as you need to to kind of practice. So once we've got a little bit of practice on, say, antiderivatives, you would have uh, a problem like this that you would go home to after class and you can test out. And we can talk about these in, in class. For example, if we wanted to talk about this one, suppose we tried it, we still had a question, we just wanted to see, uh, make sure that we understood what the solution was. So if you brought this up in class, we could talk about, all right, so we are looking at the integral from one to, no, zero to one, of two e to the x, plus six, Cosine x dx. So how do we go about this? The idea is we'd be using our rules to break this up and using our antiderivative rules. We recognize that this is the same as two times the integral from zero to one of e to the x plus dx plus six times the integral cosine x 
dx from zero to one. And then we can just solve each of these individually. We'll probably be also talking about ways to do this a little bit more efficiently than this even. So this would be two times the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. Plus six, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. So this is going to be equal to two e to the one minus two e to the zero plus six sine of one minus six sine of zero, not theta, zero. And this simplifies to two e minus e to the zero is one, so minus two plus six times sine of one. I don't know what that is. So we can just leave that alone. Minus six times sine of zero is zero. And this gives us our final answer. So we'll be able to talk about things like this. Um, if you have your own solutions, you should be able to share them. We can kind of work them out together as well. Um, but that concludes today's demo. I hope you got uh, a reasonable idea of what these courses are going to look like. Um, does anybody have any other questions about uh, this course, demonstration, what you can expect in class? I would be happy to answer them. <clears throat> uh, Professor uh, Shekhar here, just one yeah. question. Um, will the techniques of integration, like integration by parts and the other integration techniques, uh, will that be covered in that in this course? Not in this course. So that, those topics are covered in our Math 152, which is our Calculus 2 course. So we will get up basically right before that. Um, the, the next course starts off pretty, it does a couple of other derivative things and then gets uh, into those fairly quickly. All right, Professor. Got it. Any other questions? Professor, how much homework should students expect every week? So every week, so I'm actually going to be doing it kind of daily. Um, so what uh, students would expect, you see something like this. So on the day that we covered definition goal, or we're, we got done with antiderivatives and we covered the fundamental theory of calculus and we're doing something like this, you might expect to go home and find about five problems like this ready to go. And then when you come in the following day at the start of class, you can expect a quick quiz uh, on this. There'll be additional problems that won't be graded that you can also do for practice to kind of help out. Um, but in terms of required and what will be counting toward a grade, you can expect probably five or so problems covering the material of the day per day, five times a week. And Professor, would there be any problem solving sessions or tutorial sessions? Let's say, uh, apart from the lectures, if there are some doubts or if there's some difficult problems that we are unable to resolve, would, uh, would, the, would, those, uh, would there be some time to resolve those issues or those problems? Yes, generally what you can expect is, uh, We'll be coming in uh, at the start of class. You can expect a short quiz on the material beforehand. And once everybody's done with that, I will be opening up the class, not starting on a lecture, but opening up with um, what questions do, do does everybody in the class have? Is there anything for the homework we want to talk about? Does anybody want to talk about the quiz? Um, is there something we covered previously? So there should be uh, a handful of time every day to clear some stuff up. Um, and if it gets to the point, especially if we're getting toward a test session, um, we'll probably clear up more time for that. So we can do uh, a more broad review and dedicate some time to that. Uh, Ashi, uh, will there be a test? Yes, there'll be two tests during the course. Uh, there'll be one about halfway through and one at the very end. So we have one midterm and uh, one final. Any other questions? And Professor, one other question, uh, in terms of prerequisites, what are the topics that students should be familiar with uh, if they're taking this course? That is, uh, that's a very important one. Uh, so uh, it is listed a little bit more detail uh, on uh, the flyer for this course, but things that you should be thinking about are, you should be comfortable with functions, like what we saw today. Can you be given a function, plugging things in, uh, polynomials, trig functions, uh, exponential and logarithmic functions, uh, as well as trig functions. 
Um, some practice manipulating and simplifying. So algebra skills, can you take an expression uh, and uh, simplify it and divide, uh, factor things out and simplify it? Um, we'll be doing a lot of that. So being comfortable manipulating various uh, functions will be very important. Um, and then also comfortable knowing what the trig function, knowing what your trig functions are is going to come up uh, repeatedly. You should be able to evaluate um, the their hazard. <clears throat> um, so we will be not we won't be doing integrals of log functions exactly. Um, sometimes we'll come up with a u substitution. So I know it looks simple. But if you're talking about say the integral from one to e on the max dx, we want to do this integral by finding the antiderivative of this function. This one we won't cover in this course. This would actually be in the second course because this particular problem actually requires. Uh, technique called integration by parts, which doesn't cover until the next course. That doesn't mean well, we will be doing um, a fair bit of derivatives with uh, uh, things with derivatives of a uh, logarithmic function. So, for example, we know the derivative of e x ln x is 1 over x. So, an integral like ln x over x dx is something we could do by using substitution. Um, I know these look very, very similar, and e even though the second one looks a little bit more complicated, the second one is actually the easier uh, integral question. Um, so we won't cut, so that's the frustrating thing about um, integration. There isn't a set way to be given any particular function and be able to find the antiderivative. What you focus on is finding as many useful techniques as you can to deal with as many functions as you can. And we just won't cover them. Even if you go into Calc 2 as well, you won't cover enough material to be able to handle all possible functions. In particular, there are functions that you just can't uh, find an antiderivative for. For example, like e to the negative x squared. Um, there isn't a nice antiderivative for this. <coughs> So uh, I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, you won't be expected to do many, just, an, uh, you will not be expected to do the integral of just a log function in math 151. Um, that comes up because it needs another technique, um, but we will be covering uh, derivatives of all different log functions. We'll be focusing more on derivatives from that perspective. Hopefully that answers your question. If you have a follow-up, definitely ask. Any other questions? Or anything else I can help address for this course? We're good? All right. So in that case, uh, if you do have any other questions, you can uh, direct them to the team. Uh, uh, there will be a webinar tomorrow to answer some more details about enrolling and participating in the program in general. I strongly suggest you attend that. But uh, I will hang out for a little bit longer if anybody wants to stand by and ask any questions. But otherwise, thank you very much for your time. I hope you found this informative. Um, and take care. I hope to see you this summer in the next couple of weeks. I know. Thank you, Professor Dodge. Absolutely.